Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everyone to our final, uh, I'm sorry to say, sad to say, uh, Ayala Reload. This has been our association's special program to prepare us for the new now. The global program was not only to overcome this global health and economic crisis as a unified association, but to emerge stronger and better than before with greater solidarity as an association, as individual companies, and as individuals. Our IELA talks have gained international recognition for our efforts to boost fruitful discussion, collaboration, and the building of a united front in the exhibition industry. And we have emerged as a leader in developing and presenting relative informative content. And we've, we have emerged stronger and better than much, sorry, better and much more connected than before. Goal achieved, we've done it guys. Strengthening, strengthening the industry network is key right now. And we are very pleased to co-host this session together with IFIS, the International Association of Exhibition Services. This is our second cooperation with them this year within the Reload program. Our key objectives today, we're looking ahead, are gaining clarity and addressing the, gaining clarity, addressing the issue, rethinking the playbook, and working together for a rapid revenue recovery. We will start today cultivating perseverance in these difficult times, getting a new perspective, and shaping our effort, sharpening our efforts. Joining us, join us in boosting an insightful and fruitful discussion via the chat. So please uh, use the chat room for your questions. We will try to get to all of them um, as we go along or at the end of the session. And housekeeping issues, please switch on the video. We want to see your faces. Uh, mute your microphone. And again, remarks via the chat box. Throughout the journey, we've been very fortunate and honored to have some excellent speakers join us. Today is no exception, and I'm so pleased to again welcome top leaders and the new leadership generation of our industry to this talk. Thank you all for joining us. And now, finally, I'm going to turn the reins over to our moderator for today, Jackie Nell from EFGSM South Africa and an IELA board member. Jackie, over to you. Thank you, Sandy, and a huge welcome to everyone from all around the world and for joining us today. We have a fantastic panel of speakers to take us through into what our new now is likely to look like and to help us open our thinking towards big ideas. To begin with, I'd like to introduce today's guests and give you a quick introduction about them so that you can get to know them better, which makes our discussion today so very exciting and encouraging. I'm going to start with Mark Lord. He has a diploma in business and sports management. He has been the GM and business development manager for the Dome. He has been in safety for 20 years, run a venue, been an organizer, and has written the guidelines for South Africa's health and safety. And on top of it all, he does project, event, and management consulting. He's the MD for Alliance Safety, and he's a board member to the South African Events Council. I'm going to move on to Elizabeth Nihas, originally from Argentina and having lived many years in Europe, she has a combination of both Southern and Northern Hemisphere, which gives her the character strength in her business approach, bringing authenticity, inquisitive and a passion for innovation. Over 20 years ago, she joined Reed Exhibitions, was the executive officer for Arfest. She became an expert in the field of event design, content and communication strategy and association management. She is the founder of TQ Consulting Germany and in 2011 she became the executive officer for Aiello. She is addicted and devoted to our industry and enjoys in working in challenging, competitive and fast moving environments. I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Rowena Arts. She has a doctorate in international exhibition management at the University of Cologne. For seven years, she was a full-time assistant professor at the Institute of Trade Fair Management. She was in charge of the unique UFI European benchmark study, was a corporate development manager at Cologne Mesa. For eight years, she was a director of business management for UFI Paris, 
and in October 2016 was the exhibition manager, the exhibition uh, managing director for WZF, the international pet business. And in this new position, she combines her two passions, animals and fairs. Melanie Ignazia, a young and experienced uh, academic. She uh, did academic exchange program for tourism and travel services management. She, uh, she does uh, HR management and services, risk management at the Copenhagen Business Academy. She has a BA in tourism and leisure management. She's worked at Disney World. She further trained at re uh, Reed Exhibitions and worked at the uh, Tourisme for ITB Berlin. She's worked at Düsseldorf and the Norwegian Cruise Line. And in 2015, she rejoined Reed Exhibitions as a junior event manager, and she's now the project manager for Reed Exhibitions Düsseldorf. Glenn Taylor. In 1993, Glenn qualified as a chef and then transitioned into management, becoming the GM at the five-star establishment, Belito Manor, and the founding and he's the founding GM at La Francia Hotel and Spa. After acquiring several years of executive level management experience, Glenn qualified as a certified hotel administrator, administrator, which remains the highest certification an individual can obtain through the American Hotel and Lodging Association. He was the group director for Three Cities Group overseeing 45 hotels, lodges, and conference centers across South Africa. During the build-up to the 2010 Soccer World Cup, uh, World Cup, Glenn was instrumental in opening 13 new properties in South Africa. Fueled by great ambition and an excellent track record, Glenn broke away and set up his own hospitality solutions company. It was at this point that he was approached to take on the Century City Convention Center and Hotel Project. He's now joint CEO of the Century City Conference Center and Hotel, and he is one of the dynamic duo behind Cape Town's leading conference venues. Soon after opening Century City Conference Center and Hotel, Glenn also completed a strategic business management course at Harvard Business School. Justin Halls. He is a CA by profession. Financial he was financial manager at Megapro Marketing and for the past 24 years has been the MD for Scan Display. Justin has been very involved in the Exhibition Association of South Africa event greening forum and is now the incoming president for ICES. He is very passionate about the exhibition industry. So now that you've all got to know our guests, I'm going to let Mark kick off and tell us what we can expect with regards to safety. As safety has become such an important part of how we will reopen again and how we will need to operate to global standards. How can we collaborate and learn from each other to be safe that will encourage governments to reopen our industry? Mark, lend us your thoughts. Thanks, Jackie. I just want to check you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good stuff. So, I mean, the beauty thing about collaboration is how we're all sitting across the globe. I'm sitting in 37.5 degree temperatures just outside the Kruger National Park, and I can still talk to friends around the globe. And, and the collaboration that I've seen over the last nine months since March, when we realized what this pandemic meant, was that we as an industry in South Africa, for the first time, came into rooms and started speaking together. And within my own field of health and safety, I suddenly had so many peers and so many colleagues that we're doing roadshows around the country, kind of working out what this new pandemic meant. Uh, we, we collaborated with our friends in the, in, in the UK and in Germany more specifically around, okay, what next? And, and out of that came, you know, kind of some like-minded thinking around collaboration. And I probably sit on more international discussions around how to bring event safety and align it um, globally than probably ever, ever in, my, in, my, in my 20 years that I've experienced. So if we just move on, uh, Janus, to the next slide, what's critical for me is the different requirements and regulations, legislation that we face, you know, basically from region to region within each country, the country to country requirements, as well as continent to continent. And, and on a grassroots side, you know, the, the, the kind of frustrations that we have when we deal with different venues within one country, all having their own different uh, general health and safety requirements. And I'm seeing a lot more collaboration within the venue space and, and within the event space where people want to work 
together they want to have like-minded thinking in in how they approach um event safety specifically around COVID-19 and I think the positives that have come out of COVID-19 will certainly be that we've learned to talk to one another set our agendas to one side and then look at collaborate and work out how we can do that together and we're quite lucky within a South African environment is because we're quite a small market we're able to nationally put together quite um you know quite uh, important systems or, or protocols that guide us through this process uh, in South Africa we learned very quickly um, that South Africa is quite um, quite regulated with regards to COVID-19. And we've had to not only take on the global best practices, but we've had to learn what our law dictates and how that, that manages the process. So, you know, the disconnect is difficult to manage, and that's something that we're going to need to find our way through. But COVID-19 has shown us that we can do that with, with taking those challenges and, and allow us to deal with each of the variables going forward. You know, we had, you know, back in, in June, when we decided to write reopening guidelines for South Africa, one of the key take-ups, and that was to involve every single municipality in engaging with them and explaining to them what we were all facing. And interesting enough, they found very quickly that they were all dealing with the same problem. And, and suddenly collaboration was, was, was the key word. Janice, if we move on to the next thing, I think the solution to having these different requirements is that um, what COVID-19 has taught us is about working together. And I think the outcomes from this is, you know, seeing some type of central body, some type of ISO standards where we as a global community to come together around writing and understanding best practices um, and, and how do we take the COVID-19 learnings to allow us to go forward over the next five to 10 years to kind of bring the industry together when it comes around centralized thinking, around event safety, aligning our thoughts around definitions and what that means um, and ensuring that there's some type of ISO standard that comes out of event safety that then governs how we work around the, around the world. And I think our answer around that is allowing event safety to drive that agenda. And, and COVID-19 has taught us a, a, around that. And I think if we can self-regulate ourselves through this process, we can then you know, determine the base minimum that's required and then enhance those protocols depending on the environment that we're in. But without managing the base, um, base minimums, which I'll touch on a little bit later, we, we're not in a point that we can manage the way you're going forward. So if we move to the next slide, so using COVID-19 has essentially brought every continent together. We are essentially talking about the issues and some of our discussions, discussions and event safety is to try and find platforms that we can bring these kind of common thoughts together. You know, one of the things that came out of the South African Event Council is that they allowed event safety to drive the messaging on how we dealt with government and how we involved government in our processes in finding ways to reopen safely. We all have the same issue and, and, and if we use the same way to deal with these, we can find solutions to that. Um, and like they say, never waste a good crisis. Essentially, as we move to the next slide, so no matter our role within, within the events industry, no matter what we do, no matter the, the, the role that we play, our duty of care as organizations and individuals is critical to that, and that doesn't change no matter where you are. And using and implementing reasonably practicable steps allows us to apply solutions that work in our environment. And ultimately, our main job in the coming months and coming years will be to ensure that we stop the spread or mitigate against the spread of the virus in our event spaces. By accepting common basic principles about each one protect one, we can put in place protocols that work. And these are based on, if we move to the next slide, in practical terms, around four pillars or cornerstones, which are based on physical distancing, the number one um, aspect that we can implement to stop the spread Issues around protect and detect, putting in systems that protect others from others, and then finding ways to detect those that are asymptomatic and those that are symptomatic, as hard as that is. The communication around, you know, how we engage with, with all stakeholders, our sponsors, our attendees, is critical through this process, as well as being able to contract trace. Without a virus, one of the most critical things that we're facing is being able to deal with any uh, spreading events that might come out of our events. And, you know, in South Africa, we're in a situation that we haven't quite hit a second wave, we're hoping we don't. So one of the key messages going forward is around how we contract trace within environments that the hospitals can still deal with any local outbreaks. The fourth pillar that we've got to deal with is sanitization and hygiene, which is critical to that process. We move to the, to the sixth point. Practically, this can be done the world over through a risk assessment. The risk assessments often fall down within our event spaces around general health and safety and our systems. And COVID-19 has taught us that a risk assessment will determine the way we go forward. It outlines the prevention and control measures, and this mitigates 
against those that might spread the virus as well as those who will be harmed and how they'll be harmed. So that mitigates, minimizes the spread by specifically and not compromising on the four pillars or cornerstones I mentioned above. And you know, one of the one of the examples that we had recently is a simple thing like sharing a microphone. You don't realize that microphone itself can be a super spreader within the environment and how important that is to ensure that we have systems that stop that kind of spread locally. In conclusion, as we move on to the seventh point of my discussion, we need to be able to demonstrate practical solutions that, that across all segments, and so not just on an event organizer side, not just on a venue side, but all the way across the event venue chain or event chain that needs to determine. So each party has a role to play in that, in building trust and confidence. The trust and confidence comes from ensuring, uh, assuring uh, sponsors that they can spend money on our events by ensuring stakeholders and governments realize the processes that we embark and the enhanced systems that we use by giving trust to the exhibitor to come back to the market, by ensuring the buyers that we bring on board are looked after, the delegates and attendees can do so in a safe environment. And this allows us to ensure governments across the world that we as an industry are ready and can look after our, our, our events globally, certainly within the, the mass market. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Mark. That was really oh, such, such a fantastic summary. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, over the years, has uh, worked very hard in collaborating with other associations. And Elizabeth, I think Mark touched on trust and confidence and solutions. How are we going to get governments around the world? I mean, they've been so slow to notice our industry. Now that the Northern Hemisphere is going into winter and COVID cases are climbing, um, there's pending uh, lockdowns all over again. Uh, Ella has 54 has uh, members from 54 different countries. How do we survive this? Um, how do we take care of our people, our industry, and keep a positive mindset? That, that stepping stone, trust, confidence, solution. Mm. Good question, Jackie. So the question is, how can we support our industry? to better navigate the crisis and uh, how we can become more visible as industry. How can we, at the same time, uh, support our people to become more resilient and, and adapt to remain competitive? Without our people, uh, can we look ahead? No. So uh, we have to take them with us. And um, I have to say that, this battle uh, is the one devoted to our people, uh, which key roles associations plays in order to keep our people encouraged, how associations can support members and their leaders uh, to have the tools, strength and energy to motivate, encourage and support team members. Yeah, the looking ahead leaders, will be the ones uh, who empowers others and who supports the ones that are fighting on the individual level for the companies to survive. And here is uh, where uh, the associations can do a lot to their communities. And this is really, when we are thinking about the looking ahead perspective, we cannot miss the people perspective. And this is where, especially, you know, in, from the supplier perspective, we need to support our organizers, our customers, but also as an association, uh, we need to support our individual members. And uh, uh, I think that uh, from the industry perspective, uh, how can we bring our industry back to business? I think here looking ahead means uh, how can we help the industry to become more resilient? Uh, how can we, we help every single member to learn from this crisis? And how can we help to adapt faster and uh, enable, as, as uh, uh, Sandy said, rapid revenue recovery? And here is the individual person so important, and this way it's important that we address that we need to focus on the individual. But uh, I believe that we also we have also just to be pragmatical. Uh, we need to identify the achievables for a practical road. So it's, it's really important that we understand, okay, what can we do now? And what can we plan for tomorrow? 
but that we also deliver to the individuals and to the members, you know, a feeling of uh, a hope that, that they can do that, you know. Uh, and this why, for example, Mike's pragmatical approach, it is really what we need today. You know, this is our priority number one, 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 is just to have this pragmatical approach in order just to look ahead. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, we need to cultivate perseverance. We, we need to be patient and uh, we need to help our people to be patient and don't give up. Um, at the same time, we also need to focus on advocacy. Advocacy is today imperative. If we all work on these two elements together, perseverance and, and advocacy, we will have a strong impact uh, bringing our industry back to business, I believe. And uh, I think, you know, that um, working every single day, anticipating, this is where, where associations can help, truly help uh, members. And I think we need to prepare uh, our tomorrow now. And uh, here associations have a crucial role to play. So for example, programs like Ayala Reload are the best example, how can we help so that members can work individually on the rapid revenue recoveries. And this is what gives us uh, hope. And uh, hope is really, it's not uh, something, you know, in a, on a cloud. This is really what we need in a consistent way. We need hope for us means the right tools, the right perspective and the right network. And uh, I believe that a, a united front is what makes the difference in a crisis. And this is why the network and within the industry is so important. For example, the red alert campaigns and all the advocacy efforts that all our associations worldwide in the individual countries they are doing. Uh, this is what gives us as an industry a sense of belonging. And uh, this, to look ahead, we need a sense of belonging and we need also powerful individuals. And I think uh, this is the path uh, to renewal. I think this is, uh, this is the looking ahead perspective uh, uh, that we need. Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth then uh, took what she had in mind, which is to say, stay connect, stay united, um, identifying, identifying the achievers, coming together, uh, and I think being, as I said, being united. And she then approached Dr. Rowena, who has years of experience in the exhibition industry. And uh, she went to M Melanie, who's a young person in the industry and said, she asked them, how do you see the future? And how can we leave a legacy behind for the future? Rowena and Bellany, over to you. Yes, um, thank you. Yes, um, if we take the next slide, actually Elizabeth challenged us um, to look ahead, not only one year, two year, but ahead 10 years. Oh so and we, uh, we, have <laughs> we had to ask ourselves the question, how can we create a sustainable trade show industry in the future focusing on a customer centric approach. Okay, so using actually the crisis to take a chance to make a difference now. We are all now really busy with the survival mode, but sometimes it is important also to make a step back and to see, okay, uh, once I got through the crisis and we hope that many of us uh, will get through this crisis or all of us will get through this crisis, but what could we do um, different? And actually, um, one core thing is we have to understand our customers. So Melanie and I, we asked ourselves, uh, what do our customers actually really want? Um, and we see on the next slide, um, we, what we said, what do exhibitors and visitors really want from us? These are our core customers, core customers. They want to meet, they want to network, they want to exchange, and they want to experience, they want to do business, and they want to be educated. And currently with COVID-19, many, many of these aspects have been gone for them as well. So it is not only the exhibition industry uh, who is suffering, it's actually also a lot of our customers that have to look for uh, new opportunities. And we have seen also in, a, uh, in the last UFI barometer from July, uh, we see that there is uh, hybrid events are um, 
have been discussed or we see that uh, some companies actually have also started uh, digital events, but digital events also have failed for some industries because the companies uh, didn't want to follow that approach and said, no, we, we, we want to wait until the face to face is back. So for us, we came to the conclusion if we if we see all these needs face to face is still more important um, than ever. The question is, how can we deliver this and how can we deliver it in the future? And Michael did some really, really good steps and remarks how we can actually turn to that. If we turn to the next slide, um, and uh, we see on the next slide, there was one in between. Okay, well, on the next slide, we see the roadmap yeah, creating a, how can we create an attractive and sustainable trade show industry for the long term future? So the core question is, how can we transform and how can we adapt? Um, so and how can we make a difference? And if we talk to, about sustainability, we can see on the next slide, the uh, 17 sustainability goals of the United Nations, which is actually um, which have been signed by 193 nations in 2016, and which is actually the charter how to become more sustainable. But actually, it could also serve as an excellent framework for our industry to see what are aspects, where can we change something, and where can we make a difference? How can we, in the long term, uh, be an att attractive industry to youngsters? So what, what makes this attractive as an industry as such? And here, I would like uh, to hand over to Melanie, who's introducing as one of, uh, well, starting with one of the goals, um, and taking it um, and changing the approach how it could be used for the exhibition industry. We have all in all taken out six goals and Melanie, now it's your turn. Thank you, Rovina. Well, actually uh, starting off with health and well-being. Well, health and well-being has become a new significance within the exhibition industry, especially within the pandemic we're currently in. So looking ahead, we have to make sure that our customers will feel safe with us in the future. And um, therefore, it will be necessary in order to get exhibitors back on board and attract also our visitors again for future shows. Um, we have to, um, we have done with read exhibitions, for example, uh, a video of the caravan salon that took place in Germany a few weeks ago. And we've been showing our customers how uh, a show can look like with new hygiene concepts. So just to to give them an impression what they can expect in the future, that it can work and that they can trust back in us um for for any future shows so for now and for the future there has been uh, a commitment um for each other so that our people will protect each other so knowing when going to a trade show that you have you are healthy um when you go so this also relates to our exhibitors and the visitors but also our teams and also the uh, partners we are working with and of course, it's very, um, I mean, we're all in a work intense industry and um, working times and working conditions, uh, they will play a key role when aiming for a health and safe environment in the uh, exhibition industry. So going to the next slide. Um, so looking at reducing inequalities. We now have the chance to shape the future and address problems um, also our industry are facing. Uh, our industry and our young customer, they are much more sensitive uh, than everyone before. And they do have a loud voice, especially now through social media and all the communication which takes place. So just thinking about the movements for LGBTQ, Black Lives Matter, diversity, or even just Fridays for Future. So our goal should be to reduce the inequalities, especially in the international environment we all work in. Um, selecting partners who make themselves strong for the society, looking for local partners who have fair salaries, and the, the start, yeah, start with ourselves, our teams, or our company. So just for example, to give you an example, I mean, really small things, but they make a big difference. Um, looking, um, if, if you have a supporting program for any of the shows, really make sure that you have a, a selection of diverse panelists because it, it is nowadays uh, very important. Or 
um, for example, uh, a registration for a trade show, uh, not making a visitor choose between just a male or female gender when doing a registration. So our so society has changed and um, yeah, we have to as well. Okay, going to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, looking at industry, innovation and uh, infrastructure. So everyone knows the saying, necessity makes inventive. So now there's a time for us to become creative. And by inventing and uh, using new technologies, we have the chance to change the exhibition industry. My personal feeling, well, hybrid events will be our futures for sure. COVID-19 has shown us how fast we can adapt when we have to. Um, so setting up a purely digital trade show, I think has, has nothing um, we've been thinking about in the past. Um, not really, um, but probably digital, it won't work for the future um, neither. I mean, not just digital because we know people like face-to-face uh, -face interaction. But I think a combination of live and online um, where you can create a great experience um, can, can be of great success, especially because we, we also have new revenue streams um, which come with that as well for any digital extension. So just thinking out of the box and what the future could, uh, could look like, I mean, um, maybe one day uh, you can even book a host who, who walks you through the um, trade show halls while being at the other side of the world on your smartphone. I mean, just really thinking out of the blue. Um, or how can technologies help us to make lives easier? Um, also how we can, for example, use our ticketing systems um, to uh, yeah, have like health uh, checks um, before you even enter a show. I mean, just some ideas. And also um, I just wanted to uh, show you a little bit uh, about what we with Read Exhibition have done just two weeks ago, because actually uh, we had our first digital um, trade show uh, our Global Bar Week. Um, it has been a cooperation of four different uh, shows that all couldn't take place this year uh, due to COVID-19. So actually uh, within six months, we have created a new concept of a digital platform that connected the producers of these spirits and the bar and beverage industry globally. So I can tell you our industry really likes coming together for a drink in person. Um, however, we have managed to get uh, at least some of them online, learning more about the new trends and products and to get educated. And I think after so many restrictions over the past months, um, yeah, it's, it's not very easy to convince the people to, to go back online and, uh, and participate. So I think that's a very big challenge uh, overall. However, in this case, we have managed um, to set up, uh, I would say, a very modern platform. Um, which was very easy to navigate, uh, to meet, network, and explore. And on the next page, I can show you a little bit how uh, the platform um, looked in detail. Uh, just our um, uh, exhibition directory, how program could look like. And um, yeah, basically what we had uh, were more than 1,000 video meetings, which took place online. We had a lot of content uh, which we have shared on the platform. Um, yeah, we showed sponsored and non-sponsored uh, talks. And actually to, to get a type of live experience, we actually have shift, uh, shipped uh, samples of uh, new spirits actually to our customers, to the bartenders, and actually have the live experience, having something at home and yeah, connect with, with each other. Um, and actually, the, the feedback from our exhibitors and from the industry was very, very positive. I think expectations were very low. Um, so making something like this has been a great success in the end. So happy to tell more after all, if anyone is interested. Okay, now uh, I would uh, go back to Ravena and she will talk about the responsible consumption and production. Yes, for us, we also thought Goal number 12 is a very important one, responsible consumption and production. Uh, we are all acting already very responsible, but sometimes it can be still good to rethink your processes and even, uh, or especially in a crisis, it might be a good moment um, to do so. So what can, we, what can we do better? Are the processes we do the right ones or is this also a potential at the moment to change processes for the long-term future? Um, 
we still have also the, the customer um, centric uh, focus and creating experiences. So how can we create experiences in a, um, in a responsible uh, way? So what, what, is, what can we do here? Um, we also had from one of the Ayela talks before, there was the result that standard construction should be very modular. So you, you should reuse materials, you should storage. So there's a lot about modularity and technology. And this also reflects with uh, responsible consumption and production. Um, there could be the, uh, that you use regional products, uh, materials, food and workforce. And you could find the right partners, you could donate products, um, goods and association and partners. For example, um, we do have a show for pet supplies and um, at the end we donate um, the, the pet supplies, the pet food, um, which can be used in the EU, we donate that to uh, pet shelters. So um, thinking about what can we do with the products and the resources we have at our exhibitions, um, how can they be reused? Or there is in Berlin, there's a store which um, takes material from exhibitions and uh, sells it for small money to those people who don't have uh, a lot of money. So that could be carpets or that could be wooden panels or different things at, uh, from exhibitions, which you cannot use for the next exhibitions, but, with, with, um, but people with a lower income, they could use it. So sometimes we should also say, okay, be creative in what have we been doing in, in, uh, in the past and sometimes where we just throw things away, but is there a way to reuse them and also um, play, uh, have, a, have a different legacy uh, in our society? So on the next um, slide, we can see uh, the topic of climate action. You all know Greta and she has been very active and of course, we have uh, also seen that um, a large exhibition is also uh, reducing the carbon footprint because you reduce the number of flights by the people meeting. But still, there might be things which can be done in a different way. So it is good to refine processes, to carefully select materials, uh, to keep an eye on the climate effects here as well. Not only what you can do with the materials after the show, but really thinking about materials you're using before, because that will also give us um, a better, um, yeah, a, a, a better uh, position within uh, society. Uh, it's maybe also not needed that all the speakers travel to one show, as we can see it here, it works also um, digital, not always. Face-to-face -face is nicer and it gives you the emotional experience being all in one room, but sometimes it is also possible if you have a large conf conference, it is not necessary that all the speakers need to travel to, um, to, this, uh, to the show site. So technology will make it possible for them to take part. And technology is also something which might help us in the short term uh, to overcome if there are certain countries which are still in a, in a lockdown uh, and people cannot travel, um, specifically digitalization might help us to include those important buyers and exhibitors into our shows and we have to find uh, good ways for them. So um, that is also reflecting in innovation and technology. Then um, there is one favorite module I really like, um, and it's the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, and you can add innovate. So when, whatever you do, take the role, is there anything I can do to reduce resources, to reuse resources, or to recycle uh, materials, and be brave enough to innovate and rethink your processes. And of course, it is supplier selection. And that is something which is critical for us because we all work hand in hand. And I think in the conference business, you see much more that climate action has been um, has had a stronger impact because many Congress organizers already take a careful look what kind of venue they they take, what are the suppliers. So the sustainability plays there an important uh, role. If we turn to the next uh, goal, which is for me the most important one, and I think uh, through all the speeches we have heard so far, um, it's goal number 17, uh, partnerships uh, for the goals. Uh, we need to work together with our customers to create innovative solutions, but not only with the customers, we need to work together as an industry. I really like um, Michael's, um, Michael's point that we need to create 
trust and confidence, confidence and trust. So, and I think we only can achieve this if we work together. So thinking about collaboration wherever it is possible to, uh, to achieve uh, a sustainable exhibition industry in the long sense, also, also on the economic side. So sustainability is not only about um, environment and people, it is also about a sustainable economy. Um, so, and take a holistic approach. It is not about that uh, maximizing, sometimes it's not good just if one party maximizes its output. So sometimes you have to see what is the overall win-win and then you achieve a much better result. So whatever you do, take a holistic approach and try to find win-win situations, allowing us to create a more sustainable and attractive exhibition industry and work together with experts. And I would say really the word for me is co-creation, work together, work hand in hand. And there is one possibility where how you could work together and that's on the last slide and there I hand over to uh, Melanie again, we had the idea create, of a creating a kind of code of conduct, which is very similar to the idea of Michael uh, having an ISO standard, but really having here a self commitment. So Melanie, I hand over to you. So actually we believe um everyone should have their own code of conduct, thinking about what do we want to achieve in the future? Where do we want to make a difference? And this is actually just an example. It's it's from our show, Barcon in Berlin from, from last year, where we actually thought, I mean, there's there's so many products which actually, um, yeah, will be disposed after a show that we said, okay, why not uh, doing the extra work, collecting everything and just donate it to people in need. And I mean, uh, it, it might look um, just a small step, but I think um, it, it's still something and we all should think about how, how we as an, uh, as an organizer, as a, as a supplier, uh, how can we also support um, the industry in the future. So yeah, just think about um, uh, where can you make a difference. So actually, if we see the next slide, uh, again, we have the 17 development uh, goals and we thought it is really the long term view. We know that we have a lot of pressing issues at the moment, but our goal or our task was it specifically to think what kind of framework might help us to work um, on a sustainable uh, future and to see what is our legacy. So this is why we have chosen these 17 goals. And I think they can be a really good framework um, also to see where are areas to collaborate and areas to develop. So that was the approach of uh, Melanie and me for a long-term 10 years view. Oh, amazing. That's fantastic. I love it. I think it's absolutely fantastic. So much that we can learn from. Thank you, Rowena. Thank you, Melanie. So with that in mind, um, and it's being a roadmap to what a future can look like, um, we can need to work now on our own legacy using, we can use the sustainable goals and create our own legacy or our own roadmap. And it's all about sustainability. We really can bring ourselves into the future and we should already be starting to plan for the now. And this is where Glenn and Gary from Century City, they've done this already. With Glenn's visionary leadership style and entrepreneurial edge. Glenn and Gary have built the uh, Century City uh, Conference Center and Hotel from the ground up and have expertly guided the development of the Conference Center and Hotel from blueprint to reality. The role called for flexibility, swift decision making and meticulous attention to detail, all of which come naturally to Glenn. And I believe, uh, Glenn, you're doing it all over again. I think you're embracing, you've created your code of uh, conduct. Uh, tell us about it. Well, firstly, you know, what everyone doesn't know, thank you for that intro, Jackie, and what everyone doesn't know that um, Jackie's just been employed as part of our marketing team um, <laughs> with that introduction. So I'll tell the other panelists that they all got it easy. Um, Elizabeth contacted me and said, well, give us the 10-year plan and put a positive spin on it. So <laughs> my homework was made somewhat more difficult, but I then reflected on the journey that we had been through and the, the, the need to stay relevant, both as a business, as a destination, and as a country. And I think that's been the biggest challenge um, 
you know, the associations and the rotation thereof will always continue. People will always have the need for eventing, but there has been a disruptor that has possibly disrupted the, the disruptors. Um, people are looking at the likes of, of the Airbnbs of this world and saying, are they comfortable staying in that environment or are we going back to now a traditional environment? And so we have really looked at our, our plan going forward and thought, where, where can we take a spin from it? But to start, um, we, we realized that during the lockdown that was enforced both globally and certainly one of the harshest ones in South Africa, um, is how could we give back to move forward? And, and that was crucial because we had a facility, we, we had a staff, we had buying power. And as a venue, which is very different to everyone else, we were incurring hard costs on a monthly basis. Um, we didn't want to, at that stage, go through the furlough process. And so we said, how can we effectively implement something that will help us as a business stay relevant? And how can we impart what we can do onto our local community outside of the eventing industry, but certainly the community that historically would have some kind of legacy being left behind through the various events that we host at our facility. And so we did exactly that. We, we embarked on a, on a fundraising scheme from the local corporates in the area. We managed to raise some 2.5 million Rand and we then became a, a procurement where we bought the goods and we had the buying power already with our various suppliers, which was great because it kept them in business. Um, and what we did was we could actually use our staff to do the packaging. We partnered with the humanitarian aid of the Red Cross and we delivered 40 kilogram parcels to people's doors, which was enough food for a family of four for an entire month. And the end result was feeding 24,000 people, which was absolutely phenomenal. But more so what it saw was for the staff and the staff actually getting their hands dirty, the camaraderie ship um, embracing the situation rather than, than making it dull. And of course, keeping us relevant through what was a very, very difficult situation. So that, that was phase two. Yanis, if we could move on to the next slide, please. This is the, the buzzword, is diverse, diversification, especially in our world. We, we've got bricks and mortar that is possibly, or not possibly, is purpose-built, as many conference space, spaces around the world are. Um, it's column-free space so that all you event organizers and exhibition people can put it in. So it's a high build cost with various lentils and beams to hold everything up. And, and it's, it's now something that you can't just re-engineer. Um, so if you take it in, a conference center is largely put into a city to ensure its marketability and to sustain local revenues. Now, all of a sudden, we, we've got our hands tied and we can't do that. And we need to look at that and say, right, how can we diversify? How can we create new revenue streams? And how can we learn from this to kind of make ourselves future proof? And I'll give you a quick example of, of Las Vegas. If you look at Las Vegas, which is the US's biggest eventing meeting space, so there's 15 million square feet of meeting space in Vegas. Uh, 42 million people visited Vegas in 2019, of which 7 million were conference delegates. Um, Gary and I were, were one of them. Um, and then uh, if you look at the occupancies, in, in August 2019, the Vegas Strip occupancies were at 42%, uh, uh, sorry, 2019, they were at 90%, and that dropped to 42%. So although the 7 million doesn't seem like a big number when you look at the 42, it plugs holes in downtime outside of the summer months, and it really helps businesses to sustain themselves. And, and people mustn't underestimate the crucial need of the, the business eventing industry, what it brings to tourist destinations, not only to eventing and, and business destinations. So that's one side of it. The second side of it is then we have to look at our current venues and say, right, now how do we take all the stuff that Mike spoke about earlier and how do we retrofit our facilities to accommodate that? Well, that also comes at a huge capital cost because you've now got to re-retrofit re these spaces so that we can give you, the event organizers and the associations, the confidence to A, sell us as a venue, but certainly as a destination. And, and that's why I love the, the ISO collaboration that we all work to one goal, 
we make sure that there's a global understanding of what the delivery and the, the structure should be. And, and we subscribe to that um, so that we can confidently market ourselves again to that, to that eventing industry. What we have also seen is that we've had to do a massive um, diversification of our staff. Um, you know, we've got chefs that are housekeepers. We've got security guards that are banqueting managers. Our traditional meeting and events team are now your operations team on our virtual platforms. And the entire thing has changed upside down. So you, you, you just become a master of all and your, your job description is a thing of the past. You can make a paper plane out of it and throw it out the window because there's no, not many other planes flying at the moment. Um, so that's, that was a huge staff diversification that we had to go down. Um, and then we, of course, had to go into this virtual world. The reality is the virtual world is going to be with us, as, as everyone's correctly said. Um, I think it got accelerated as a result of COVID. Um, and so everyone said, right, how do we, we put ourselves into this virtual world? And all of a sudden, our entire event industry became a master on, on how to build a platform and let someone in and let them out. And, make sure your bandwidth's right. And of course, if someone did have put bad bandwidth, it had to be the, the event organizer's fault. It couldn't be their bandwidth issues. So we've, we've evolved to that. And that virtual platform we know, certainly for the financial sector and a lot of the corporates within South Africa have turned around and said, guys, next year, we're going to reduce our conferencing face-to-face -face requirements if allowed to by 50%. Uh, we will evolve to the hybrid and, and make sure that the rest of the, the company is, is broadcast to um, on, on the virtual platform. And so our spaces have become restricted. And I think the big, the big thing that we look at is, is on the development side is, is that you've got to make sure that every square meter delivers a return. Um, you've got to make sure that your space is give some kind of ROI, otherwise it's, and then now with COVID and the restrictions that we've got, we have to look more stringently at that. And, and this is where this diversification comes at. We agree that there's, there's certainly, it is going to exist in that, but there's a lot of companies like farmers, et cetera, that need those networking opportunities. And so face-to-face -face will have a place and will always hold its, hold its own. I just think that the regularity of it will be reduced. Uh, on the business side, Gary and I have chosen that we now need to forecast certainly almost monthly, but we've, we've cut that into forecast uh, uh, quarterly as opposed to biannually. And you've got to share with your stakeholders that three to four year recovery plan so that they understand, yes, we're going to go backwards to go forwards, but it, it, it is a process and we need to face some kind of realities. So we've cut it up to say that our, our, our 2021, because our, our financial year is, is a June ending, We've called the year of COVID and 2022, we've, we've said that that would be a consolidation year. 23 is a recovery year. And with all of your help, hopefully 2024 will become that year of prosperity where we will we'll rise above Britain and recover some of the losses. But it's, it's, it's a collective, we talk collaboration, that's going to be a buzzword that's going to be around for a long time. And I think that destinations are going to have to park bid support and realize that the love certainly from the association sector has to be shared globally to sustain the airline and the tourism industry. Um, and then finally is, is, is from us is, is that we need to make sure that there's destination confidence. This, I can't stress more, you know, this COVID has been death by social media where you've got the uneducated trying to push Part a, an educated view on all the symptoms and what's happening and trends, etc. Um, so we need to remain relevant, and in that we need to maintain customer confidence, um, and we need to encourage destinations to make sure that there's a positive spin in the messaging that we we give out. Um, airlines are critical um, to all of us as destinations need to be accessible and they need to remain accessible. So without them we've got bigger problems on our hands and, and we need to encourage that again. And, and we certainly, we do, we speak with that voice, we, we, we're excitable. And hence you can see on the slide behind you another uh, certainly big development that we are doing as to, to complement the current development that we've got um, building another hotel for the conference center as we know that this node will spark again. Um, however, when I say that, I, I think that 
bigger convention centers are going to have to re-engineer themselves in terms of accessibility, load in, load out, making sure that there's social distancing, so perhaps adding a few more entrances and exits, et cetera. And we've certainly had to look at our designs of our hotels and certainly the new hotel that we're building um, to make sure that we, we, we are compliant into the, the new COVID era and what we perceive as the new normal, although that changes regularly as well. So in closing, yeah, I think it's, it's for all of us to remain confident. Um, certainly from the hospitality sector, we need to work collaboratively. We need to work with the convention bureaus, with associations, uh, with the event organizers, certainly with local and national governments. Um, and we need to speak with one voice to make sure that we, we're ready to welcome the global arena back to our destinations. However, the onus is certainly on us to make sure that we're equipped and, and we can't let everyone brag about it and, and suddenly the, the delegate arrives at, at your shore and, and we're not ready for it. So we do believe that there's a, a three year plan and, and certainly I'm not gonna look at your 10 years because hopefully in 10 years time, Elizabeth uh, and, and everyone else on this panel, I'm sitting you know, having a glass of wine at our mix or one of the shows and we're saying, geez, do you remember that Elizabeth hounding us for that 10 year plan? Well, look, look at <laughs> So that's it for me. Thank you. And I hope I've shared some, some insight. That's absolutely amazing. Thank you. Yeah, Glenn. That was uh, truly insightful and encouraging. So I think what's coming through, there's such a trend that's coming through all of your discussions is that it's uh, customer confidence, uh, trust, solution, rebuild. Justin, you've been involved in our industry for so many years. You're passionate about uh, what we all do. What are your final thoughts in moving us forward with confidence uh, to plan for our big now? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jackie, and really great uh, to be to be on the panel. Um, and you know, it's sort of uh, a lot of things have been said. Um, you know, from the other speakers, uh, we've we've gone through a timeline. When Mike's spoken about the immediate things we need to do, and Elizabeth came in about the communities being important and the medium term from from Awina and Melanie, and then we had just had a great story uh, uh, from Glenn just in terms of what they're doing. So it's really interesting to see um, what people are doing and what we need to do. Um, I'm my sort of uh, parting uh, comments are really and and just to go back, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of. The, the big three, three C's and, and communication, collaboration and commitment. And, you know, I just wanted to sort of finish off with a story um, about the three C's. And, 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 you know, throughout these talks now, we're having a, a talk about collaboration. We're talking about communication and our commitment. There's a street in Soweto called Vilakazi Street. And uh, you'll see in the slides there, there's on the left-hand side, the big twin towers where you can actually bungee jump off them in Soweto. Um, big cooling towers, and then there's Vilakazi Street. Now, Vilakazi Street is the only street in the world where there are two Nobel laureates who lived there at one time. So it was Nelson Mandela and it was Bishop Tutu. Bishop Tutu is still alive, and he still has a house in that street. Um, it's a monument, his, his house, but you can't go in it because it's his other house. And, and you know, the, the, the story around this is, uh, and, and, you know, maybe you want to just take get, get onto the next uh, slide, uh, and this, um, so, um, so there's a thing called the SA Events Council, and it's uh, uh, started, and Mike Lord spoke about in the beginning, where we felt we needed collaboration with the South African industry. The South African industry came together with 17 associations and very diverse associations, some in business events, uh, some in concerts, some in, in, in consumer events and came together um, and, and practitioners as well to create the SA Events Council. So we could as talk as one to government, which was just an amazing thing. And, you know, in all these years, there's been people talking about coming together, but nothing really happened. And it was, it was thanks to COVID, uh, the fourth C, that this actually happened. And Mike spoke about the collaboration that we needed, and he spoke about international collaboration. So there was this SA Events Council that was, 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 was started in March this year. And about three weeks ago, there was a request from Becky Twala, um, the guy in the middle of the picture there, um, to actually have an event in Soweto 
in Velikazi Street, the very street where Nelson Mandela and uh, Bishop Tutu lived, to actually have, and you'll see uh, Mandela's house at the bottom left there, the Mandela house, um, to actually have, a, have an event there to share in Soweto what our vision is in terms of going back to normal um, and, and, and managing in this, in this COVID crisis. And what's quite interesting about that, um, and it's a great story, is that there's an organization, the Soweto uh, 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 Business Chamber, and this is a division of the business show. Becky Twala has organized an events section. Here's an organization that's been running we didn't even know about. And this is the kind of thing that uh, what, what is really great from, from, from COVID is you, these people come out and you understand new things about an industry and you understand new uh, avenues for us to tap into as, 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 um, as organizers, as venues, and as contractors. So in this whole thing, Becky came up and it was three weeks before, two weeks before. And it's amazing, you know, within two weeks, you can pull an event together. He pulled this event together. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a talk which we did um, in, in Soweto, in Vilakazi Street. We had five or six speakers um, in, that, in that event. And, you know, I think it really uh, talked to the three Cs. The one is uh, collaboration. So we all collaborate together. And we had Ellen there on the right-hand side who actually organized it. I called it the point of the spear. Uh, because she was very involved in bringing it together. We had communication. We spoke to uh, members there and we spoke amongst each other. And I think what's very important, collaboration and communication need to work together. You can't, you can communicate, but you need collaboration at the same time. Um, and it's such an important thing, uh, the collaboration, the communication. The third element of the 3C for me is commitment. So, you know, you spoke, Glenn, about what you're doing there. Uh, we spoke about the development goals um, from, we, from Rowena and Melanie. We just need a commitment to that. Um, Elizabeth spoke about communities working together and Mike in terms of, of, uh, of safety, um, immediate safety. And that is a hard one, is the commitment. And, and I see that on the chat, there's been a lot of crazy things going on and we, we might be expecting a lockdown. And even in South Africa, we, we might be having a lockdown here. But, um, you know, in Germany, that's a, it's an imminent situation and there are various other countries throughout the world that are, are facing an additional lockdown as we go into the into the second uh, second wave but at the end of the whole thing is we have a great industry we have a great medium um, in terms of face to face and i think we mustn't lose heart and it's very difficult to maintain that commitment so i think we must keep communicating keep collaborating and, and keep committed committed to um, are re reigniting one day, and I can't say when it is, and I'm sure nobody can on this very uh, webinar. Um, but we need to be committed to to finding solutions and committed to 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 uh, growing our industry back to where it was. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Justin. That was amazing. Um, as you said, there's uh, some countries are locking down, others are, seem to be opening, as I've seen in the comments now. So I, I agree with you. We just need to be stay focused and stay committed. And uh, yeah, good luck to everybody. Elizabeth, thank you for putting pulling us all together. We over to you. Thank you to you, Justin, Jackie. You have been, let's say, the motto, the energy. Uh, of this project. Uh, thank you so much. You know, this is a best, best, best example to associations working together and uh, looking ahead. And uh, thank you to uh, Mike. Uh, Mike, please, please make the ISO standard international. Make it happen. We will support you. We will commit to it. Uh, to our organizers, thank you for looking ahead and uh, just uh, keeping up the fight with us. To Lynn, our venue so thank you thank you so much for investing and keeping up the fight from your end and thank you to you know, all of you uh, just for communicating and just sticking to this association to, to this industry together because this is what we need a united front that communicates that uh, collaborates and that commits so see you the next time until the next time goodbye stay safe and stay tuned thank you <laughs>